Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 and The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. As Moses summarises the main events of the creation in chapter 1 we might understandably come to the conclusion that God created male and female at exactly the same moment. But then, with a little thought, we might realise that chapter 1 tells us that God made humans male and female, but it doesn't actually tell us how he did it. That's what we learn when we come to this chapter. And we ought not to think that Handling things this way is unusual because we actually do it in everyday life. Now, for example, you might go into work after a day off and report to your workmates that you had a busy day and got all sorts of jobs done. One of them was that you left the car to the garage to get it serviced. Later on, at lunchtime, one of your colleagues who is actually interested in cars might ask about the service and what you got done and all sorts of details will come out about that particular task plus the fact that you also got a steam cleaned and got it validated. That's what we have here, the details of the general picture. Why did the Lord God do this in stages? Was it purely arbitrary? Again, we ought to expect that God has a reason for doing it this way. Later on in Scripture, we will learn that there is a real significance. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, that Adam was first formed, then Eve. He makes the point that this demonstrates that God has given a particular responsibility to the man, to the male. Similarly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, he writes that the man was not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And that that demonstrates the headship that God has put into his creation. This, this was not Paul's idea, but God's purpose to illustrate the relationship that we as humans have to our God and that Christ's church has to Christ. Male and female are, are equal, but they are not identical. There are different, different and distinct roles. That we are created in the image of God, as chapter 1 tells us, confers humanity with a tremendous dignity. But that should be appreciated with a tremendous humility because in this verse we learn the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And following the fall, God reminded Adam that dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Chapter 3. The psalmist wrote, he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Psalm 103. And we ought to remember that too. It would remove a great deal of pride from us. The word formed in verse 7 possibly conveys the idea that God made man just the way you might or a child might form a figure out of plasticine. But, but that doesn't quite convey the intricacy of the human body that God made. From its molecular machines, its various tissues and organs, and the finely tuned systems that sustain physical life within it. But without one important addition, it would have remained a lifeless construct. To this form, God imparted life. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The mystery of the origin of life is answered in these words. Life came from the living God. There is no other source of life. And from this breath, you and I also have our physical life too.